We're joined today by Aman Jabi. This is an interview that I've been looking forward to for quite some time. Aman has the most comprehensive and amazing knowledge that I've seen of the structure of the incoming central bank digital currency, what they're doing behind the scenes to set up all this infrastructure or the fact that they already have it in place. And Aman is one of the most, as I said, knowledgeable people on this subject that I've seen. Aman, thank you so much for joining us today. We really appreciate your time. Thank you, Maria, for having me. I appreciate you having me here. It's a pleasure. So before we get into, uh, you've got a presentation for us, which everyone needs to see. Um, I'd just like you to spend a couple of minutes introducing yourself to the audience. Let them know a little bit about your background and your history and what actually makes you so knowledgeable on this subject. Well, my background is uh, primarily in technology. Uh, I spent over 25 years, almost 28 years in Silicon Valley, California. And professional background is in electrical engineering and computer science and, uh, you know, um, deep technology. I've done hardware, software, but primarily I was working on video and camera technologies for the last 25 plus years. So um, my observation over the years was that, you know, while camera technologies are used amazingly by consumers and my focus was primarily on consumer electronics. So that included uh, technologies such as video streaming, computer graphics, um, uh, you know, we, we built computers for uh, animation studios in Hollywood. And then subsequently in the last 20 years, I was more focused on mobile imaging and cameras for cell phones. Uh, I also have co-founded two camera startups. So I have deep knowledge in this uh, subject, uh, you know, through my professional background. And I have, you know, interacted with all the major companies that make cell phones and beyond, uh, including cameras for autonomous driving vehicles and stuff. And so, and in general, I'm an independent researcher. I've been, I read a lot since 9-11. I've been doing a lot of digging into a lot of things that are happening in the world. Um, I generally don't watch television or read the newspaper. Uh, so that Smart allows me man. to kind of have a <laughs> have a different view of the world. Yes. Uh, you and, and I so had, that's had kind a, of my background. You and I had quite a lengthy conversation prior to this interview and we spoke about a lot of these topics. And you know, I can I can definitely say to the people watching right now, Aman really is awake to the entire agenda. He has a deep understanding of these things. And what I'd really love is to start with your presentation. And if you can take people through the knowledge that you have, and then I'll interject as we go along. And um, so, so we can really get an understanding of the things that you're presenting. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about, you know, what is facial recognition, how it has been introduced to us in the world. Then I'm going to, you know, do a switch from the infrastructure of surveillance cameras that are being put up in China, USA, and across the world. From there, I'm going to uh, move on to defining what is a digital identity as proposed by the World Economic Forum and how it's going to be linked to a new type of digital currency called the central banking digital currency. And then from there, we can talk about, you know, what's happening in our lake, local areas. So I'll touch upon Montana and you can also, you know, add stuff, what you're seeing in Australia. And then from there, there'll be other little linked topics like social emotional learning and how, you know, uh, human capital index is going to be manipulated for making money for, you know, Wall Street and the trillionaires. And then we'll talk about, you know, solutions from there. So Brilliant. that's how I'm going to proceed. So how does facial recognition work, right? When you pick up your, many of the smartphones today have a, you know, a 3D camera in the front. And what happens is that 3D camera has a little bit of a, a laser or an LED invisible projector that projects a dot pattern on your face or some sort of, you know, other pattern. And then that pattern gets uniquely distorted for every person's face. And then there's an invisible light camera that picks up that distortion and then is able to identify, you know, key points on your face and uniquely identify that, you know, this is Aman or this is Maria. So that's how facial recognition works. And it's been sold to us as a benefit because it's very convenient. I don't have to punch in a four or six digit code into my phone every time I want to use it. Right. Yes. So that's how facial recognition was introduced to the world. Many of these and, things, many of these so-called technological advancements have been introduced under the guise of convenience, but what they're actually leading to is, as you said, a digital prison. That's right. And so 
So they, they give us the carrots, right? If you go back 20, 25 years, uh, consumer electronics, computers, cell phones, and other gadgets, uh, video games, they're all kind of subsidized, you know, very low cost so that they are able to permeate every corner of society. So like even, you know, people who are not very well off, they have all these gadgets. So they're sold to us as the carrots. And it's for convenience and it's also for safety and security, right? And it's to catch the bad guys. And, you know, as a society, we tend to kind of accept all the carrots. But by the end of the presentation or even halfway through it, you'll see how the sticks are coming if we don't watch out. And they've already started and most people are, you know, they don't know what's coming. Mm. Indeed. So if you go to China, Big Brother has already met Big Data, right? They already have facial recognition, uh, which is connected to social credit scoring, and that directly lends itself to a control system. And they've already announced it in China for many years. Uh, I was in Shenzhen, China in 2019, three years ago for an optical conference. And every corner you go, intersections, streets, buildings, indoors, outdoors are just littered with cameras. And there are screens everywhere. And they are telling you that we are watching you. And you know we are watching you. And you will be okay with us watching you all the time. And so people have become very compliant in China. Right. And so you can then control the social credit system. It's like a feedback system on how people behave. And this is how compliance has been achieved in China. Now, they're already doing this in, in, in the Western countries. It's just that they haven't told us yet. So our social scoring has already started. Our carbon tracking has already started. Uh, I was in India recently. And when I got my receipt from United Airlines, it had a carbon dioxide, a carbon footprint of 3.3 tons each way on the receipt. So Yes, the conditioning's so, already started. And we're talking here in Australia about banks starting to notify you about your carbon footprint on your transactions. So that conditioning, you're absolutely right. We're already in that system. That's right. But the narrative is there and it gives people the illusion that all the surveillance being put up in our cities and our towns in the Western countries is for security and safety of the people. But what is not said is that per capita cameras in America are greater than in China. We have 50 million tethered surveillance cameras in the United States connected to the internet and therefore to AI. And by 2025, $2 trillion would have been spent on cameras and the surveillance infrastructure of smart cities. Right, London is ranked number three in the world in terms of number of cameras per thousand people. Right, so the infrastructure is in place and is expanding. So if people, you know, look up and they keep their you know wits about them and go out in your towns and cities, you'll see more and more surveillance infrastructure being set up, and it'll all be sold on the pretext of safety and security of the people. I didn't so know London was Co ranked number three. That's very interesting. That's right. And uh, it, it, New Delhi, India is ranked number one in terms of cameras per square mile. Wow. So there are well over half a million cameras in the city of Delhi. Uh, so just think about that. Uh, so while the world was sleeping, when COVID was announced and people were locked down and the fear porn was, you know, blaring in every, uh, you know, television set and people were quarantining, they were installing cameras and surveillance infrastructure. A report that came out earlier this year, by end of 2022, there will be 1 billion surveillance cameras tethered and connected to the internet in the world. And if you take mobile cameras and other cameras, that's greater than 20 billion data collection cameras in the world. So that's that is the terrible. kind of surveillance that is being, uh, you know, unrolled onto the world. And this is by the end of 2022. So th these are not for, uh, you know, us. this is not just to catch the bad guys. This is much worse than surveillance. This is data collection. That means everything you do will be logged and uh, tracked and analyzed. And then it will be used as a feedback loop to change your behavior and compliance. And this is so think about that. being fed back to an AI machine that's already been programmed, as you said, with that feedback loop to change your behavior. So so it it is already, I mean, everything's already been programmed into this AI. 
to be able to and continue it's it's been programmed and continuous continually being improved yes so basically what we have is you know eyes in the sky and eyes everywhere eventually we it's already started but it's going to be permanent once uh, they they will be tracking your eye movements continuously when you're in front of a cell phone or you're in front of a computer they already do that many apps yes but that's going to become prevalent right so in the old days what was surveillance a bunch of cameras around the city and there'd be people sitting and watching these lcd screens or led screens for you know thieves and all but and so human eyeballs are gone now no humans are necessary all the monitoring will be done by smart artificial intelligence security guards that are watching us at every moment and so you're being you know literally Uh, they are listening in they are watching they are analyzing they are logging they are learning and then it repeat the cycle i have a question amani so, you mentioned it, you mentioned uh, sort of 20 billion devices around the world are all of these devices also listening uh if they have a microphone chances are they are listening like your cell phone is listening of course like the zoom call is not only listening it's recording analyzing our discussion <laughs> and we are being scored by ai as we speak and since i'm talking to you and you're talking to me our social credit score is being uh, reduced in real time as we speak so so when are we not alone pretty much never right and if you have devices in your house uh, you know such as ring cameras and all those are all tracking devices but let me introduce to you a, a, a a term called the panopticon which is a kind of a circular prison and this is a picture from uh, Rhode Island one of the states in the United States of America uh, back from the late 20s and this is a circular prison where the guards are in the middle and they can watch pretty much all the activity going on in each prison so all the prisoners know that the guards can watch them at any time uh, where we are living is in a digital panopticon right and instead of uh, there being security guards there's computer vision cameras with computer vision and artificial intelligence so everyone is being monitored everywhere all the time and so this has been put in place already and a few years ago i was you know uh, at a venture capital summit uh, in new york city and this in- term was introduced called the internet of eyes and i found it kind of not creepy but i was kind of curious as to why the storm was there but literally now everything is falling in place it's the internet of eyes there are cameras everywhere at intersections all your automobiles are spy vehicles they have cameras inside and outside um tomorrow by 2025 there'll be an average of at least 16 cameras in every new vehicle and once you have autonomous driving vehicles there'll be radar lidar as well as cameras and some might even have sonars uh um, they have cameras in space looking down at the earth counting trees um and mapping digital ID- ids to trees they have cameras in drones license plate readers cameras inside your car cameras in bus stations airports so you're being tracked everywhere did you so just this say is the internet of eyes did you just say mapping digital ids to trees yeah every tree and plant all of nature is going to be mapped digitally and eventually we'll be getting pushed into the metaverse the, the, I, this is this is fascinating to me because what they're doing aman is they're currently shifting uh you know all humanitarian causes towards climate change and looking after what they call mother earth according to nancy mm-hmm. pelosi and and they they're meeting this month for an interfaith meeting on mount sinai where they're announcing their new climate 10 commandments it's it's unbelievable what these people are doing and so that's right that would mean if they are digitally mapping every every tree every plant then that that would also um be able to impact your score should you interact with one of these trees or plants or harm them or you know emit too much carbon affecting this plant or so they say um th- this would also impact your social credit score there there really is no escaping from this surveillance yeah we'll talk about that uh, about the escaping part towards the end but sure. uh, in general you're right and uh, th- they're doing a lot with trees and nature i was saying if you have uh, technology at home you have eyes and ears at home and so each of us is helping big brother if we have technologies from companies like these 
uh, if, if you use Google products, Samsung products, Facebook, Microsoft, or Zoom call, for instance, uh, you know, Apple watches, they're, they're one of the worst things to have. Um, you know, the ring cameras, uh, they track every device on your network, uh, its location, its movements all the time. And of course, if you have a ring camera, as the camera's generations improve, they are also identifying when you're coming home, when you're leaving, who's coming to visit you. So all the tracking is going on and the scoring is going on even when you're at home. So I'll just make a switch to, you know, uh, these LED lights. Um, I started to notice in San Francisco two and a half years ago that a lot of the, you know, the low pressure sodium, the yellow halogen type of lights, they started getting replaced by these very bright uh, array LED lights. And yes. when I, have you seen that in Australia? You must everywhere. have seen it everywhere. Everywhere. Yeah. It, and they're putting it up like literally in, in the denser population, every 30, 35 yards apart. Um, it's really horrible. Uh, I live in Montana, which is relative in Northwest Montana, relatively, uh, you know, a lower population. But in the closer towns and cities, they have a lot of these and it's really putrid, right? And these are called smart lights and smart poles, uh, which are an integral part of the smart city infrastructure. They all are wirelessly communicate with each other. And then there's fiber optic cables under the ground, uh, which are then connected to, you know, 5G towers and to other communication facilities nearby. So and what they also will they serve? They are basically it's it's an open air concentration camp for surveillance as well as I'll show you it'll be weaponized. These are these are these can be weaponized these LED lights, and then they will also host all sorts of sensors in the name of climate change and global warming. Right. So here's an example of a smart pole. They'll have noise sensors, and it's for noise pollution, but actually it's really for listening people's conversations. Of course. They'll have people counters. They have surveillance cameras. They will have pub public address systems, like in Auschwitz concentration camps, where. You know, the soldiers are giving orders to the, you know, uh, to all the people who, who are the prisoners. Top of the lights, they are drone charging stations. So in the future, drones will be uh, used both individually as well as in swarms as the aerial police. And I've done, you know, there's a lot of information available on DARPA and other websites on these drone swarms and how they're going to be used against uh, you know, enemies of the state. We don't even need a huge police force anymore because we're going to be controlled and policed by AI. Right. Smart poles and smart lights are an integral part of this uh, smart city grid that they are building everywhere. They communicate with each other. They are wirelessly connected as well as, you know, some of them are uh, connected through cables underground. They will some of them may also assist in autonomous driving vehicles in the future. Um, and they're putting smart cables under the roads and all. And so there's a lot of technology going inside the ground and on top through these lights right. um, in order to achieve a lot of the surveillance grid uh, integrated with 5G. I can't even begin to imagine how harmful all of the all of the signals um, that these things are emitting are. I mean, we already know how harmful 5G is. Imagine when we have all of these constantly emitting and communicating with each other. It's horrible. It's very harmful, as well as these blue LED lights, uh, you know, at the frequency or wavelength they are at, they are extremely harmful to the eyes. And in addition, uh, I've noticed that they don't even have diffusers on top of them. So you can't look up at these lights. They're designed to make humans look down. Wow. So by default, they're you know designed to really hurt your eyes. And then I, I'll show you another uh, slide on how they can be used directly as weapons. Please. So uh, I, when I came to Montana, uh, you know, in August 2020, uh, so a little over two years ago, I noticed that they were on uh, outside of maybe Bozeman, Montana, and a couple of the towns. There were none of these street lights. Uh, it's we had beautiful dark nights, and then I was here in April at this town called Pablo, Montana, and driving through the highway and just see how many lights there are. It's a population of just a couple of thousand people, and you have like hundreds and hundreds of these lights on the highway. And so the question to be asked is. 
earlier there were no lights and then in the name of global warming and climate change and energy conversation now you have 300 lights yes so you know just think about that Yes, well, it's it's much like how 400 private jets arrived to a climate change conference to talk about CO2 emissions, Aman. That's, it's, the right. hypocrisy is just astounding, but they don't care anymore. I don't understand. When, I, when, when I've said the words digital prison, I, I think it's very hard for people to actually uh, imagine how that will be achieved. This presentation is key to that understanding. So I'll ask everyone who's watching, please share it with everyone and get them aware of this information. I started, you know, this uh, picture on the right side I got from somebody in Canada uh, on Facebook, and I haven't seen these in anywhere in Montana yet, these multicolored lights, and I started to dig deeper, and uh, I noticed that there's a, something called a puke ray. It's an LED incapacitator where you have this, uh, think of it, this is an LED gun which is able to emit different frequencies of light at a very high f rate of change, so... When you do this um, at a very high frequency with different uh, lighting, and if there's a human being that's in the vicinity and looking at these lights or near these lights, you can get intracranial damage. You can hurt your spine. You, you can get sick. I bet you, you it can even kill you. So these can be used as weapons. My and a lot of these LED smart lights... They already have little, if you'll see uh, white squares at the intersections, for instance, uh, white patches, those are radar. And the LED lights combined with radar, they can, and with a you know smart uh, system on a chip inside, they are able to uh, identify human beings with guns a few hundred meters away. And so these lights can be turned on as weapons against people who might be carrying guns, for instance. So one needs to kind of start asking these questions and talking to, you know, each other within communities, as well as to the people who you think represent you as to what the hell is going on and why these lights are being put up and call them out on it. I mean, what, what other reason would you be installing lights that have the capacity to to kill on impact? I mean, it, 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 there's no other reason it, other it's than... for safety and security it's ah, for safety and security right. yes, of the of people yeah my goodness so that's how it's going to be sold or it's going to be sold in uh, as climate change and global warming and energy conservation so i'll go on from here but these can be used as weapons and i suspect there's much more to it than what i'm presenting here and i'm i'm doing my research and i will come back and talk about what more i find out yes please uh, my research is not complete. So, so I've spoken so far about you know what facial recognition is, the camera infrastructure, the smart lights infrastructure, and you can see already a link between all those topics. And now I'm going to introduce the digital identity and the central banking digital currency system or uh, the digital currency linked to your digital ID, and then you'll start seeing how everything connects. Right. So the World Economic Forum, I, I read a paper maybe two years ago, it says it's a new chapter in the social contract. And I said, but this is a social contract nobody has signed up for. Yes. Right. So it's being planted upon the world. And so in that paper, I saw this diagram and you have this digital identity in the center. Every entity, every device, every person, everything, every tree everything will have a digital identity. And that digital identity is going to be used to unlock your access to financial services, healthcare, telecommunications, government programs, social platforms, logging into the internet, travel and mobility, just everything you do in your life, you need your digital identity to unlock it. So by default, a digital identity implies that you are always in a digital prison. Yes. And you need permission to get out of that prison. By default, you're always a prisoner. That is how you have to kind of, you know, understand how this digital identity is going to be used. And this is a 2018 WF, uh, WEF uh, paper that was published. And so for your digital identity, you need identity integrity. Like, for instance, there's a concept called know your customer that banks are using, right? So it's basically taking steps to a digital identity. And how is that digital identity going to be authenticated? Through your face. 
to unlock access and your face and your digital identity will be linked to a new type of uh, currency, which is the central banking digital cu currency. And it'll have a combination of water and carbon scoring for you and carbon credits. It'll have social scoring and your medical status based on vaccines and jabs and other medical things that they want you to have. So essentially just think about it as if you don't comply, because these are all compliance based things inside the currency. If you don't comply, your currency becomes lower and lower. If your currency becomes lower, your digital ID cannot unlock access to life. WHO Immunization Agenda 2030 plans to introduce 500 new vaccines by 2030. People think I'm crazy when I say that. It's in their own documents. Immunization Agenda right. 2030, it's there. This vaccination status is key and your submission to regular medical procedures is key for your digital identity to function. You won't be able to have it unless you get continuous vaccines. And I keep going back to my first interview with Karen Kingston. It's the most bombshell interview. And I'm going to link it in the description below because in that interview, she proves from the patents, every single vaccine approved by the World Health Organization is a lifelong subscription. They will never stop this. Yeah, that's right. So the one of the things to understand is that if you don't sign on to a digital ID, and if if there's a you know critical mass of people, I think most will just walk into it unknowingly. Yes. Uh, through deception or through you know uh, so-called force, just like they had people taking the vaccines to travel freely. Uh, yes. But if there's a critical mass that doesn't sign on to the digital ID, then this agenda gets weakened substantially. Absolutely. Right. So one needs to therefore understand in conclusion is that the digital ID is really your ticket to being in the digital prison permanently. Forever. And this, yeah. is, this is exactly why we're doing what we're doing right now, Amand. When I tell people about this stuff on the street, regular people, strangers, they say, I don't want to be part of that. And so the only way to do it is to understand the agenda so that you can resist it. And we will talk, That's you and right. I, we will talk about how to do that later and, and how to be free from this system. We're going to have that discussion. But first we have to hit people with this is actually what it looks like if we don't say no. That's right. So how are they going to implement it in, in practicality on, on your computer, for instance, right? There's a new... Um, relatively new concept in cybersecurity protocols called zero trust. So by default, since you have a digital identity and you're in a prison, you are by default a criminal. So we don't trust you. Every time you need to get something access to something which you think is legitimate, even to buy food, by default, we don't trust, trust you and you have to prove you are you and you have all the compliance metrics through your CBDC to be able to you know, access whatever you need to access. So in the old days, like when you log into your computer you, you, you know, you, or your cell phone, you put in a password and then after that, you pretty much have access to all your applications on your computer. So that's called implicit allow, right? There's one gateway you enter in and you're implicitly allowed to do whatever you can. The zero trust protocol is a default deny. So we are going from implicit allow to default deny worlds. And at the heart of this is your digital ID. So think of it as default deny and you have to, for everything you're doing in your life all the time, every step you're taking, whether it's to open your car, start your engine, put in gasoline, you know, log into your computer, log into an application, uh, call your friend by default, the world has been locked up and so and you are in this inverted prison while you may not see locks outside you but the locks are all there and you have to keep unlocking your life right so here's an example when you go shopping how is zero trust going to be used here's a lady she wants to go and buy some beef but let's say her carbon footprint or her beef footprint for the month has been exceeded that door won't open Right? If she wants to buy, say, apple juice, but she's had too much sugar because they're tracking everything, that door won't open. Right, And at the heart of this is your digital ID. And the whole concept of digital digitalization 
which is a relatively new term also coming from the World Economic Forum, it means conditional access. So to access anything in life, there are conditions. This is all linked to your digital ID. It's all about being a prisoner all the time. And there'll be a face recognition camera at the top of each of the doors looking at you and figuring out who you are and what your digital ID represents. And of course, people that think that they'll just be shopping from home, your phone will be doing the exact same thing that the doors of the Ex fridges will be doing. Exactly, exactly. Right? So the, the, there's a bunch of companies that have started. It's called IDAS, Identity as a Service. There are face recognition as a service. So lots and lots of companies are building businesses around this. And every time anyone's face is in front of a camera, there's a chain of corporations making money from camera companies to IDAS companies to networking companies, cybersecurity companies, the whole shebang. And it's it's since human beings are everywhere, this is how this is one of the ways that they have come up very creatively that anytime there's a face in front of a camera, which is going to be most of the time since people are always on their devices, there's continuous chain of data and therefore money being made. Right, And there's another concept called geofencing, if people are not familiar with it, but, but it's really, it means that they can just think of it as an invisible fence around you or somebody uh, at a certain distance beyond which you cannot go, right? And so your face and digital ID is going to be used for controlling your access by implementing a geofence, depending again on your, uh, you know, your currency, your digital currency, right? So where you can fly in the world, that can be limited. How far you can drive, that can be limited. How far you can walk, and this is related to your 15-minute cities or 20-minute neighborhoods, they can implement this. And they don't need guards. They don't need prison guards at the outskirts to stop you. They have the LED lights and the LED weapons. They have the microwave weapons, as well as they have the digital currency can be shut off, right? So you move 15 minutes out, your currency won't work. You can't buy anything. So you are not going to be motivated to leave. And they call right? them districts, Aman, in Sydney, here where they're testing it. They're actually calling them districts. Yeah, I read about that not too long ago. In San Francisco, they've had districts for a very, very long time. But I don't know at what point they're going to start implementing it over in California, but they will. Oh, I think the agendas but... are going full full speed ahead in in. Uh, Australia more than any, any other country. You're not wrong. You're not wrong. Yeah. And uh, you can also be geofenced in the, in the metaverse, so to speak, right? So who you can communicate with, who you can text, who you can email, what you can read, what music you can listen to, when you can listen to. So they can control everything through this digital ID and your face in front of a camera. Well, people will it go to the metaverse. They will not only will, they they will be uh, they some will go voluntarily. Yes. And then what they're going to do is like let's say you wanted to buy like today there are apps where you you can buy groceries on your app right Instacart for instance is very popular in America in American cities. So today it's on your phone. You can't go to a website and order on Instacart. You have to use an app on your iPad or your phone. Tomorrow they will move into a virtual reality headset. And then they'll phase out the app from your phone. Now you can only order food through your VR headset. Yeah. And that is how you people are going to be sucked in, right? Uh, a lot of the entertainment will be moved out of web pages and they'll, it'll be moved on to uh, VR headsets. And they're going to subsidize AR and VR headsets or extended reality, XR, you, your MR, mixed reality. You pick your favorite letter in front of the R. But... This is how they're going to do it, either through by deleting apps and convenience will be shifted to all these headsets and people are going to keep getting sucked in and it'll happen every year or two more and more. The problem so is very that a soon, lot of... Sorry, go on. No, like for instance, uh, uh, ordering a cab mm -hmm. now in San Francisco, if you go, you it's very hard to just hail down a cab. It's either Uber or Lyft or even the yellow taxis now are on an app. So you can't physically, so that means you always have to have an app on your phone to hail a cab. 
Yes. And then tomorrow, they won't take your credit card with a US dollar or an Australian dollar. It'll, take, it'll be a digital currency. So, so, so they'll just keep, you know, very cunningly keep moving people into this new system. The video recently on YouTube, and it was a gentleman talking about how great VR is and how we're all going to be going into the metaverse. <clears throat> And so many people are of the opinion that, no, it, they won't succeed with this. You know, meta stocks are down, so on and so forth. This video had one million views, Aman. One million views on one video talking about how great VR headsets and the metaverse are, it is. And, and there would be so many others. What I'm trying to say is that's one million people that spent their time spent their time watching this rather than informing themselves about what's really going on in the world. And, and that's the biggest problem that we have. It's the masses not realizing where we're heading. That's right. But one can only realize it if uh, you kind of take the time to, you know, unlearn what's been dumped into your head through mainstream media. Yes. And it's scary to get to unplug from the matrix um right. but but we have to we have to keep educating people because right. not only their future but our future depends on them waking up please right. do go on yeah and and ignoring reality is not a good strategy for survival i mean that's mm. really my take absolutely like however scary the reality is like you got to face it you know otherwise the the consequences of ignoring reality you can't ignore the consequences you can ignore reality but you can't ignore the consequences of that reality when it when it strikes correct right so let's talk about smart city reality right so smart cities are also been sold to us on the larger agenda of the 17 sustainable development goals of the united nations right and it's really about zero carbon and this is how they're selling it to us right air quality smart lighting water management noise pollution traffic monitoring etc and it's really about limited mobility and no car ownership, right? Smart lights will be used as weapons and surveillance and control of people. Water rationing, right? Speech surveillance. The microphones are not for testing noise pollution, mm. right? Traffic monitoring is really about tracking mobility and uh, electricity, gas, and heat will be rationed also. And they are coming for controlling all the energy in the world and rationing it. So the quality of life is going to reduce. At the heart of this is your digital ID because digital ID with cameras, smart city infrastructure, the LED lighting and 5G networks are all integrated in order to track all the activity of everything in and around smart cities. So just remember your face and digital ID is at the heart of this and is required to make this successful so what happens if someone says no i'm not going ahead with the digital id man how, how can then, you, they... then you don't get into the new matrix and you have to find a way to survive outside that new matrix mm. i'm I, i'd like that option please right and mm -hmm. so if you can find enough I, I, i'm not saying it's an optimal solution because of the way they're trying to control energy sources uh, petroleum gasoline natural gas propane etc if they can hoard all that we have to find a way to, you know, uh, have energy sources outside of what they manage to hold. Uh, but we can, we'll have that discussion. Sure. What I want to say is that, you know, uh, the Trojan horse is security and privacy, right? And inside the Trojan horse is your digital ID, which means total control and compliance. But it's being sold to us as security and privacy. Right in in schools, what's happening in schools and for children, they have a concept for many years called social and emotional learning, and they they've been at least in America that's what it's called. I don't know what they're using it in in countries like Australia, but what they want to do is from cradle to career they want to have complete control of children, right? And so they are using cameras on tablets, on phones, on you know uh, inside homes, everything. Algorithms are screening for child abuse, for instance, right? And AI will decide whether you have good parents or bad parents. And if AI says, hey, I'm looking at this child's face, the child is looking unhappy and now has been unhappy for N number of days, 80% of the time. 
AI can send child protective, uh, you know, custody people to your house and take away the kid, right? They have this uh, talk pedometer where when a parent is talking to a child, this is a product already in the market being sold on the web. When the parent is talking to the child, it's recording what the parent's saying and then is scoring the parent. So if the parent is teaching the children uh, that climate change and global warming is all one big BS hoax, their social score goes down, you know, and then their score goes down with respect to how they're parenting their kids. Here's a little LED screen. It's uh, We Play Smart is the company. They have this board game and they are fisheye cameras looking at all the kids and they can change what's happening on the board and the game based on facial expressions. So that you can wow. manipulate kids' behaviors in real time. At the heart of all this is the digital ID, which is being identified through the cameras inside these devices. So child data is big business. And you must have read uh, papers through the World Economic Forum where they talk about, you know, human beings are extremely valuable and we need to find clever ways to extract maximum value from them. And so there's a concept called human capital index that was created by some people who published these papers in the World Economic Forum. So they are using SEL and securitized markets, just like they securitize, you know, home loans and all that stuff, derivatives of things. So all this SEL and data harvesting from children is really there to manipulate kids' minds. And Here's an example of where they can take, say, top performers from a particular region in, say, Sydney, Australia. And what they do is they can bet on their predictive performance or what they call pathways. Which direction will this kid go? And they can, you know, make bundles of things called prodigy asset groups and they can bet on it. And depending on the results, they'll make money. Wow. So they're going to use kids and their predictive uh, you know, success or lack of success to make money. You can short it or you can make calls. They'll make even more money from the broken kids because there will be intervention and they will be, you know, they will have uh, mental health issues. With uh, Exactly that statement that said data is the new currency. This is what this human capital index is. Data is the new currency. The, but really all this is using cameras and observation from the cameras that capture the faces of these kids and their eye tracking movements and their facial expression, et cetera, then, then manipulate what's on their screens. And so this is, it's a management and control system. It's not about knowledge. So if people are sending their kids to schools, know what you're sending them for, because it's not a good idea. Absolutely. Right. And then in April, for instance, there was an announcement where the multi-stakeholder internet governance, so the, it became a global internet and the World Economic Forum and United Nations and the international bankers, they took over the internet. So at some point when the digital ID is fully unrolled, if you don't sign on to a digital ID, you won't be able to communicate. Again, yeah, as I said, without a digital ID at some point in the next few quarters, a few years, we may not be able to communicate with each other through the traditional means of the internet. Uh, there's a company called Clearview AI. Uh, yes. I believe it's in the US, which is collecting, you know, tens of billions of images of faces around the world. And uh, they are building a predictive, they're, they're basically building a, a software for predictive policing and pre-crime using their images. Prue displayed a behavior that could potentially suggest that you were about to commit a pre-crime. This is how far this goes. And so that, it, it... actually it goes further. It goes oh. further. So <laughs> it goes further because this is based on predictive analytics, right? They are already starting prescription analytics. So they, so they can pre predict what they want. Somebody is going to do, but they can also prescribe behavior through control of what's on your screen and other things and what's being shown on your screen, your Instagram feed or whatever. So it goes on and on and on. Yeah. Yes. So who are these agencies? Basically the stakeholders, right? And uh, 
There's another company called ID.me that is doing public. It's like a public part, uh, private partnership, what they call P3s. And it's partnering with all the state governments uh, to authenticate uh, and prove that you are you before you get your, you know, uh, sec social security check or your health coverage, et cetera. And their uh, tagging line is no identity left behind. So it's for equity and inclusivity, your digital identity. The same thing that the World Health Organization Immunization Agenda 2030 yeah. says, no human left behind, vaccine right. equity, vaccine equality, the same language. What they're doing now, if you want to get these services through state governments, not only do you need a password, they, they ask you to upload your passport or your driver's license, and then they make you take a video selfie and attach it before they authenticate who you are. That's the kind of stuff they're doing now. Yes. And just for everyone thinking, you know, with every little step, with every little increment that, that has happened, Aman, uh, people think, oh, well, it's just, it's just technological advances. Oh, I don't want to do this, but, you know, for the sake of just getting it over and done with. And meanwhile, right. they're collecting a database on your behavior that's going into the most advanced AI systems that you could even you can't even fathom to engineer right. and change your behavior. And for the people watching this broadcast, they're definitely people that don't want to be controlled. So I know that they'd be keen to remove themselves from these systems ASAP. But the problem that we face, Aman, is that we need broadcasts like this to understand the level of the agenda. So how do we get around this? So we, we are coming there. Uh, once we, so that I think, once we accept a digital identity, it's game over for humanity. Currently, we are also in a slavery system. Many people don't understand that. But since they've given us the illusion that we are free in some Western countries and maybe some other countries, we generally believe we are free, even though we are not. But we are currently in an, a debt slavery system. Yes. And what, what is being introduced is an identity slavery system. So there's a transition happening from debt slavery system to identity slavery system. And a lot of the truth movement is trying to fight to stay in the debt slavery system. And that's, that's not the right answer. Because this system needs to crash. The level of corruption and deceit has reached levels unknown to modern humanity. And this system needs to implode if we want to start out right. That doesn't mean we go into a worse system, which is the identity slavery or the new agenda 2030 system. So that's, that's something everyone needs to process and figure out how to think through that. And Will Harari, uh, I think a couple of years ago in one of his talks, he was making a presentation at one of the Davos conferences and he presented a danger formula where B times C times D equals R. So what is B is the biological knowledge which is being gathered through, you know, either in your jabs or through your DNA swabs, etc., or your PCR tests. C is the compute power that AI needs to, you know, Compute, do all the computations. So we have no control over the C. That's already there. It's kind of infinity. And then D is the other data being collected through our faces, through our behavior, and through various other things. And if there's enough B times C times D, then your ability to hack humans is increased. Yes. Right? So in order to collect data, they are putting sensors everywhere. That is why they're saying sensorized everything. That's why there are cameras everywhere, microphones everywhere, radars, LIDARs. They need as much data as possible, right? So the beast, like if you are a, I'm not a Christian, but I have a lot of Christian friends and they believe in the whole, you know, the beast system. Yes. But really it is a beast system, whether you take it religiously or, you know, practically, it's a beast system that is being unrolled. So AI is the beast. The beast needs food. And the food is data that comes through all these 
data conduits or sensors through the, you know, the smart cities, through cameras, through the 5G networks, autonomous driving vehicles. So the only way to starve the beast is to remove the data conduits. You cannot stop the data because human beings are going to continue doing what they are doing. Yes. So, but what, what we can do is get rid of the sensors. And if we can achieve that, we make a serious dent, dent into this beast system because that's where the beast is getting the food. It's very important to understand that. No amount of laws, legislation is going to stop this. It has to be done by the people. I agree. The answer has always so, been the people. Yeah. So just to summarize, you know, cameras are used to take pictures of your face, videos of your face and identify you through facial recognition, which is sold to us as security and privacy. Your facial recognition directly links you to a digital ID, which is linked to a central banking digital currency, which your currency is actually, people have heard the term blockchain. All the data about you is sitting on blockchains in the back and it's linked to your digital ID. So literally the blockchain linked to your digital ID is your digital leash. This is your digital prison. And this will result in the final lockdown of the human race if we allow this to happen. The final lockdown. Nail in the coffin for humanity. That's right. All right. So this is what I basically present is at the very least look up and observe. They're putting all this infrastructure in place and they do it incrementally and they do it overnight. But everyone needs to understand what's being put up, the rate at which it's being put up, and why it's being put up, and what will be the consequences if we don't find a way to undo all this. Right? Parents need to understand what's happening to the kids through this, uh, the information I presented, and dig even deeper. But cameras are coming up everywhere in schools, colleges, parking lots, always. They are being monitored inside the classroom, outside the classroom. And the question to ask is who installed, authorized, and funded these uh, the surveillance infrastructure? I know, but I think that question needs to be asked and people need to you know, figure out the answer for themselves. Because once you get onto that path to finding these answers, you learn a lot and understand how this agenda is being unrolled. In conclusion, you know, there are silent weapons that are pointing at the human race all around the world. And uh, there's an infrastructure being put into place where we will be in invisible chains permanently. And uh, we need a critical mass around the world to recognize this and do something about it. And that concludes my presentation. I, I want to I wanna take people through this article from Forbes. You, you can't see it on your screen at the moment, Amman, but I'll, I'll read it out. It's, it's an article from... 2016 World Economic Forum. Welcome to 2030. I own nothing, have no privacy, and life has never been better. Ida Alkin. And it, she, she goes on to say, welcome to the year 2030. Welcome to my city, or should I say our city. I don't own anything. I don't own a car. I don't own a house. I don't own any appliances or any clothes. It might seem odd to you, but it makes perfect sense for us in this city. Everything you considered a product has now become a service. We have access to transport, accommodation, food, all the things we need in our daily lives, so on and so forth. First, communication became digitized and free to everyone. Then when clean energy became free, things started to move quickly. Uh, they, they talk about all this great stuff. Uh, sometimes I use my bike when I go out to see my friends. In our city, we don't pay rent because someone else is using our free space. But it's very interesting because um, also she says, um, once in a while I, ch I choose to cook for myself. Um, shopping, I don't really remember what that is. For most of us, it's been turned into choosing things to use. AI and robots took over so much of our work, so on and so forth. But here's the thing. My biggest concern, this is what I wanted to highlight. My biggest concern is all the people who do not live in our city. 
Those were lost along the way. The way, yeah, I've read this a long time ago, yeah. Those who decided that it became all became too much, all this technology, those who felt obsolete and useless when robots and AI took over, those who got upset with the political system and turned against it, they live in different kind of lives outside of the city. Some have formed little self-supplying communities, others just stayed in the empty, abandoned houses in small 19th century villages. Now, I want to get your take on this, Aman, because... I, I, I don't know. Uh, people have been talking about breakaway societies, you know, exactly what you're talking about, you know, forming those connections within the communities, trying to wake people up. But do we also need to be focusing our attention on building these breakaway societies, just like this, you know, article says the people that were lost along the way living in their little communities? What do we make of this? That's a more complicated uh, kind of discussion. Uh, I mean, you can. The point is that let, let's say you you form a community of say thirty people or fifty people, right? You we are going back to the I mean the Stone Ages in a to some extent. Like let's say you build a commune and you are able to grow your food and you are able to sustain yourself through firewood and heating, depending on where you are, and you have a well where you still have access to water, but they are trying to take that away. It doesn't solve the problem. You see, what you're doing is you partly help them achieve their agenda for yourself because without an automobile, without gasoline, you are not traveling way too much either. Right. Right. And you are not going to have access to their electrical power plants, getting electricity in your home. Right. So. If you don't enter the matrix and while you don't have a digital ID and don't enter the matrix, you you are helping their SDG 17 achieved goals to some extent. Because we are all going to be poor in that new system. We are all going to be relatively more hungry in that new system, et cetera, et cetera. So I don't believe that that is the true answer. It may be a temporary answer. I think where I'm thinking is it, it's a there's a lot of things to connect, but I think it's really important for the people who are on the journey to learning the truth to understand how we came to where we are today. That's really important because if we don't understand that, then after all the turmoil that's going to happen in the coming years. And say for the people who come through alive, can we build a better world? But we can only build a better world if we understand how we came into this horrible place in the first place. And this has been a multi-generational, you know, multiple hundred years of uh, treachery and deceit and the trickery that has allowed us to uh, arrive where we have as a human race and as a civilization. You're absolutely right. And I've often said, if we're successful, we need a complete restoration of the way that our societies operate. We need new education mm -hmm. systems. We need new financial systems, uh, you know, whatever. The, the entirety of society has to re be rebuilt without the influence right. of big pharma, without the influence of big tech, and perhaps for some time returning to the Stone Ages. So be it. We're adaptable human beings. We can make it happen. Um, but, but Aman, uh, your solution at a local level is one that I, I really respect and appreciate. So just talk to people a little bit more about what you're doing at a local level and how they can actually start doing this in their own areas. Why is this the most powerful way? Uh, it's okay. I don't, I, okay. It's not necessarily the most powerful way in every place in the world, but it's powerful enough to some extent in where I am. I live in a Northwest part of Montana. Population is relatively low. I'm in the Flathead Valley. I think my county is probably a few thousand people, not not even 10,000. Maybe it's 10,000, 15,000. The entire Flathead Valley of, you know, a few hundred square miles is only 100,000, 120,000 people. I have had direct access to my county commissioners and my sheriff, uh, as well as Montana state legislators. So, you know, I've been able to communicate with 
many of the right people in the process of communicating with them i have discovered that none of them have the power to do anything i have also come to the conclusion that they don't represent the people so i think i said in a previous interview with kate mason also to australia that i don't believe that any of the western countries or any of the countries in the world is there any corner where there is representative legitimate representative government of the people yes there are all right. corporations everything has become a corporation and it's been done through treachery and deceit and through the um deceitful uh, words used in commercial law over the several decades so all our so called governors and senators and congress people they all work for a for private corporations so when we go to elections and vote you're not really voting for your representatives yes you're, you're just voting that for system that's already set up you're waiting within the corporation so it's all hogwash so they give you the illusion that you live in a free country and that you should vote but voting also is implied consent so think about that so the solution then is massive education at a community level with people M massive understanding of how this was done to us and then take back the power as the people and it starts at a local level it starts at a local level so imagine if you're living in a place with you know 500 people a small village somewhere in the middle of eastern montana where the population is even lower demonstrate that you can build a legitimate form of i, I don't even like to use government right but a legitimate you know structure of how to live well and then people will duplicate that and then there will be links between these groups and within those links then trading can start and we can with the amount of knowledge that we have already accumulated through history we will develop into a more advanced society at a rate unprecedented to human civilization in the past absolutely and we and we've done far more research as well especially in the past 2 years and become familiar with all the areas of corruption become familiar with how incompetent and sinister the pharmaceutical companies are with how much government just does not function at all as it should i mean this is not this is this is achievable what you're talking about is achievable but it requires that mass awakening and this is what the truth movement is continuously calling for mass awakening keep going keep educating people our lives and theirs depend on it that's right your freedom depends on mine and mine depends on yours it's astounding isn't it Yep. Aman, I know that you said that you've been off social media for for some time. I mean, not 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 as active as you used to be. But if people want to follow your work, where can they find you? Yeah, I'm not as active. Uh I I got onto Facebook uh, actively a little actively only in March or April time frame, but I'm not terribly active, but they can find me on Facebook. I have an Instagram account, but I really do I stopped posting on Instagram. about a year ago once i started getting censored so heavily there so i just stopped posting stories there <laughs> uh twitter i had a very healthy following but my censorship level is so high that i've stopped using twitter altogether so best way to do it is like if you want to you know uh, if you have questions connect with me on facebook and then you know i can help uh to the extent i can i will help Well I I'm so grateful for the work that you've done so far to raise awareness about this as I said one of the most comprehensive explanations of the digital ID digital prison that I've seen um we're Thank so you. appreciative of your time it, we've gone way over the allocated time and we we appreciate you staying back and I'd really love to have a follow up discussion in the future Aman to really um you know about, about some of these other topics the LED lights and whatever it else it is because as as we said mass awakening requires mass understanding and uh and this right. is what we're trying to do here aman jabi thank you so much for your time and everything that you're doing thank you so much for your what you're doing too have a good night you too